everybody. Welcome to Clarksburg Baptist Church. My name is Carly Harbaugh, and I serve in the kids' ministry here. We just want to take a second and welcome all of you that are with us here in person and online. If you're in person and you have Facebook, why don't you hop on, share the live stream, and greet somebody in the comments for us. We have a few announcements this morning. Before I get to announcements, in your pews, you will have some connection cards, and we do encourage everyone to fill those out. We now have an option for a digital connection card that you can just scan the QR code on the screen and do it that way. But at the end of the service, once those are filled out, you can put them in the back of the pews or in this black box on your way out the door. This Friday, this past Friday, the kids had painting. So on the screen, you can see some pictures. Um, they had a really great turnout. And while they painted, they got to hear the story about Jonah. Um, so that was really fun. And we're really thankful that all those kids came out. And we do hope to do more of those in the future. Our second announcement is about our new series that we're going to kick off with our kids' church starting next Sunday called Did You Know? It's a four-week series that focuses on Easter, and all CBC kids will be going through it. So we do encourage you to bring your kids all four weeks. Um, it's just a really great way for them to hear the whole Easter story. Our last announcement is about our Above and Beyond. You can still participate um, throughout this week, but the money will be going to the Ukrainian refugees who have left their home. So you can give online at cbcgiving.com or here in person. Now let's stand and worship together. Good morning, everybody. Let's lift our voices to our faithful God to do his good. And let's respond to him with music.
Praise the Lord, we serve a risen Savior today. You may be seated. So glad to see each and every one of your beautiful faces. Andy, this is a good looking crowd this morning, isn't it? Especially good. You guys really showed out this morning. We're also happy to have each and every one of you. We got about 40 people online. If you want to go in and jump on that and uh, say hi to them as well, we're super excited to have you there as well. So we're going to head into our time of Uh, Worship that we call the offering. And I wanted to read some verses for you. And as I read these, I want you just to think over them and realize that these are directed, these words are directed right at you. In Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today, and the throne in the fire tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. These verses are promises towards us that God will take care of us if we put him first and seek his kingdom first. You know, most chi- uh, children never wonder about where their next meal is going to come from, what kind of clothes they're going to wear. We trust that our parents to worry about those things. And in this passage, Jesus reminds us that our heavenly father will provide for us. After all, he provides for the birds and the flowers how much more will he provide everything that we need? So trust the Lord to provide for you today. And the first step of trust is to put God first in all that we do, and that includes our finances. And that's what this giving portion of the service is, is saying, God, you have enough for me, so I'm going to give back to you, and I trust that you're going to take care of the rest. You know how to give here at Clarksburg Baptist Church in person in our black boxes. You can give online as well through the app. And uh, let's go ahead and pray and ask God to bless this uh, offering as we come together to give. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much uh, for loving us and caring about us and taking care of us. God, I pray help us not to be worrying people, God. There's so much going on in the world today and we wonder what the future holds. 
And uh, your word reminds us that, that you have all of it under your control. I pray you continue to take care of us as a church like you have uh, since 1848. I pray you continue to help us to remember our mission, God, that we need to love you and love people and go. God, thank you so much for all you're going to do. I pray as we open your word that you would be pleased and honored, and I pray you would change somebody today. God, someone that's uh, struggling this morning, someone that's far away from you, someone that needs answers, I pray that you would speak to their heart today. In your name we pray, amen. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids. We've got uh, Miss Jessica Wagner back here for the Kids Church, that's K through 2, and then also... We've got Becca Williams back there, all the way in the back for our loft kids. Super excited about our children's ministry. If you know somebody that's looking for a church with awesome children's workers and uh, just a great group of kids, this is the church to come to. Have you ever met anybody that was super obsessed with a certain person, maybe a celebrity, a sports figure, or... A uh, historical person. Seems like at every opportunity they bring this person up, they quote this person often. Now that's kind of weird if that person is like Nicolas Cage, right? That can get a little bit strange. But it's not weird if you're a Christian to constantly bring up Jesus. Last week we saw Jesus raise a widow and uh, a widow's only son from the dead. And that's that's what we're doing with Jesus the series, is we're focusing in on these little things that happened and zooming in on everything Jesus said and everything Jesus did while on earth so that we can do what Jesus did and say what Jesus says. We saw Jesus last week care about this widow and then he did something. And we may not be able to raise someone from the dead, but we can bring life into a situation by bringing the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. We can share our life with them and be like Jesus. Now, I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but family can be kind of a weird thing, right? It can get a little bit awkward, right? You can be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You can wear power suits and drive a luxury car. But as soon as you step into your childhood home, you're just little Jimmy, right? Who used to uh, put paper clips in the socket, right? That's who you are. It's weird. It's like family is a time machine, and which is good, right? But it also is awkward at times. It keeps you grounded. It keeps you humble, remembering where you came from. But it can also pull you back into your insecurities and shame, remembering who you were in the past. We don't often think about how Jesus had a family. We remember Mary and Joseph, right, from the Christmas story. But Jesus had brothers and sisters, Half-brothers, right? Joseph as their father. His brothers' names were James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And Jesus also had sisters, although we don't know their names. But I'm sure being a brother or sister of God in the flesh was a difficult thing, and it had its challenges. But we see something kind of strange happen between Jesus and his family that's found in three of the four Gospels. Only John doesn't mention this occurrence. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 3, if you want to turn there right now. Mark chapter 3. Jesus is doing ministry in this passage, and then his family shows up. We'll be in verse 31. And it says, his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and brothers? And looking about those that sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus is preaching to this large crowd, ministering to people, doing miracles. And he's traveling around. He went back to his neighborhood called Nazareth. And there were so many people following Jesus at this point. I'm sure that it felt like things were kind of getting out of hand. Then his family shows up and they want him to stop. That's kind of weird, right? 
But let's rewind a few verses to verse 20, and it'll tell us why. Earlier, he had, had went home, and a crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Jesus' family hears about all the people that are following Jesus, and they think that he has lost it. Maybe they're worried about Jesus, that he's making too much noise, and the Romans and the government was going to shut him down and arrest him. Maybe they're worried about him, or maybe they thought he was going too far. And we'll see in this passage in a minute that religious leaders show up and accuse Jesus of being possessed by Satan. I don't know if that's happened to you before, but that's always a tough pill to swallow, right? So it's obvious Jesus is making waves. He's getting people's attention. Now, we know that Mary knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And we know that she asked Jesus to do miracles at the wedding feast. She knew about the angel and all that different stuff. So she isn't doubting who Jesus is, but she did struggle with the how. Right? How is all this prophecy, uh, uh, prophecy about Jesus going to happen? We also saw this when earlier in Jesus' life when they went to Jerusalem and Jesus was a teen and his parents lost him and Mary's flustered to find him in the temple teaching and she said to him, why did you do this? She's confused about why Jesus left them scared for three days. And Jesus says to them, I have to be about my father's business. God, my Father. Even as a teen, Jesus knew that he had a bigger purpose. So Mary knew who Jesus was, but she still didn't want his, to see him hurt or in trouble. She loved him, and she didn't want him you know, to have that type of uh, trials in his life. But we don't know how uh, his brothers and his sisters felt about him. At this time, maybe at this point, they really did just think that Jesus was crazy. I do know that if my brother started telling people that he was God in the flesh, I would definitely think that he was crazy as well. If you knew my brother, then you'd understand that. Either way, Jesus knew that he has to be about his father's business, and he knows he's doing exactly what God wants him to do. And his family wanted him to stop, whether that's to protect Jesus because they thought he was in over his head or whether they just thought that he had lost his mind. Regardless, they were, uh, were not excited for Jesus to tell his story and do God's will. They were either scared or embarrassed. But Jesus answers them as his family tries to pull him away from the crowd. Jesus says, pointing to the crowd, this is my family. Whoever, whoever is following God and doing his will is my mother, brother, and sister. Now, I imagine if I said something like that to my family as they attempted to try and help me, whether it was misguided or not, they would probably be pretty offended if I said something like that. And Jewish families in this culture were especially close Knit. And many times they would live very close to their uh, families and where they grew up. And, and family was just very important in this culture. But Jesus is reminding his family that he is on a mission that is bigger. And his goal is not to be popular or to save himself from harm or to be accept, uh, accepted by the religious elite. Sometimes we think of Jesus' death on the cross as being a culmination of a situation going downhill fast. But this is pretty early in Jesus's ministry. And even now there are people that are trying to stop him. But what Jesus's family doesn't understand is that with his life, Jesus was going to start a new family called the church. And the church is a place where people that want to do the will of God belong. So what can we learn from this event that happened in the life of Jesus. Well, the first thing is this, is that sometimes following God's will for your life can cause tension between you and your family. There have been many times that families have felt the strain of one person giving it all up to follow Christ. Maybe a parent that has a broken relationship with a daughter who decided to follow Jesus. 
Or maybe it's a son that won't leave their kids with uh, his parents because they don't want, he doesn't want his kids to hear about Jesus from grandma. There's others that feel what Josh and I have felt, where we have left our families far away to attempt to follow the will of God for our lives, wherever that may lead. And maybe you've felt that way. Maybe that's the reason that you're a teacher or a nurse in Harrison County and not someone else, uh, somewhere else. Because you feel called and you feel like it's what God wants you to do. And sometimes that can cause strain in a relationship. Situations like this are not always easy. Jesus' ministry definitely caused some awkwardness and tension between him and his family because they didn't have the same goals. And you not going to a family brunch on Sunday morning because you're gathering with a church family at 10 o'clock might cause a little bit of awkwardness in your family too. Or answering the questions honestly, like why you believe the Bible and what it says about a certain moral issue, that might cause some tension in your family. Choosing a job with a purpose instead of chasing after the American dream because you want to help people like Jesus did, that might not impress your family. You not being intimate with your boyfriend before marriage might seem strange to friends. You trying to change when people keep bringing up who you used to be might not be particularly helpful to you. And it feels like people are trying to hold you back from what you know is right. See, if you surrender your whole life to Christ, it might cause some tension and even some pain. But you can rest assured when all this happens, that Christ died to give us the church and when you seem like an outsider other places, you still belong with your church family. Now you do know, and you do need to understand, that in order to have relationships, you have to cultivate relationships. Just like you can't just expect corn to grow in your yard so that you can eat corn. You have to plant it. You have to break up the ground. You have to fertilize. You have to cultivate relationships. A person that wants friends, the Bible says, must show themselves friendly. You can't just not spend time with someone and assume that you're, uh, they're going to be your closest friends. We need to spend time with each other around dinner tables and coffee tables, nurturing genuine relationships built on our mutual love for Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Hospitality is part of the Christian faith. And that means spending time with those that are in your church family and those that you hope to see believe the gospel. You need your tribe. You need people headed in the same direction. You were not made to walk alone. And even when Jesus' family tried to pull him away from what God's will was, Jesus says, I have people that are headed in the same direction, and they will support me, and they will be my family, even when my blood family is trying to pull me away from God. So right in the middle of these two sets of verses that we just read, the scribes bust on the scene, right? And they want to know what all the hubbub is about. We didn't sanction this meeting. This is not the way that we do things. See that in verse 22. And the scribes came uh, down from Jerusalem and were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons, he casts out the demons. We can be tempted sometimes as religious people to say, This isn't my thing, this isn't my way, so it must be wrong. The scribes were meticulous about their dedication to tradition, the law, the scriptures. They were the ones that got to interpret for the people what the Bible meant. But even though the scribes often clashed with Jesus, they weren't always bad. We can thank them for their dedication, for copying the scriptures, for the fact that we have an accurate Old Testament today. But we see here that at the time of Jesus, how Far they had gotten away from their purpose. They claimed to care about God's message to the world, but they look at God in the flesh, in the eyes, and say that he is the devil. 
Their perspective is all messed up. And Jesus says, look, if I'm Satan, why am I fighting against the things of Satan? Why am I casting out demons in the, if I'm working with Satan? Jesus wasn't working with evil and the devil. He was overthrowing. He came to crush Satan's head. So this is blasphemy in this passage. To accuse the work of the Holy Spirit of being the work of the devil, that's a serious sin. And Jesus makes that clear, that you can't reject Christ and the Holy Spirit and be a follower of God. You can't toss out two parts of the Trinity and serve the same God. So this brings us to the next thing that we can learn here. And that sometimes following God's will for your life will cause people to think that you are wrong or maybe even evil. The Son of God was literally following the will of God. He had never sinned. He was God in the flesh. And the religious elite accused him of being possessed by Satan. So don't be surprised if when you're trying to do what's right that people may think that you are a hateful or a bad person. Now, don't get too excited. This isn't an excuse to be a hateful and a bad person. But if you follow Christ long enough, it's going to cost you something. There have been a few times in my life where I sacrificed something to try to do what was right. And I knew it was right, and I I understood, and I prayed over it. And those are some of the times where church folk have looked at me and said, he isn't listening to God, something's not right, or even accused me of doing something wrong. It's hard to stand up against comfortable people that are entrenched in their ways and their narrative and ask them to change. Now, we need to be open to the fact that we could be wrong and and be open to accountability. But even when we know that we are right, this can happen. And I'm sure you've experienced this too, right? It's hard to stop a conversation and say, hey, this isn't right. We shouldn't be talking about a person like this. Someone may accuse you of being judgmental or even a bad person or bring up what you've done in the past. That type of uh, bravery to say, hey, I can't participate in this, that might cost you something. It's hard to give someone a second chance when everyone else has turned their backs on them. They might accuse you of being shallow or having too much grace. But the prophet Isaiah pronounces a warning to people that get caught up in calling God's things evil. In Isaiah 5.20, it says, Woe, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. We need to be careful that we're not looking at good things and calling them evil. We need to be careful that we're not looking at evil things and dismissing them as good. I grew up in a church that believed that anyone that, didn't dis, uh, that anyone that didn't agree with us explicitly were bad. They were going to hell. Now, there are non-negotiable things. But a lot of what we care about is preferences. If God's doing it, I want to be in on it. I don't want to be like the scribes. I don't want to miss what Jesus is doing. I don't want to stand in the way of the movements of the Lord. I don't want to call good things evil, and I don't want to call evil things good. So I have to guard my heart and submit my mind to the Savior and ask Him to give me wisdom and to show me the difference between good and evil. There was one day that God came to a man named King Solomon and asked him what he wanted more than anything else. And at this point in King Solomon's life, he was very humble, and he knew how hard it was to lead people. So this is what he asked God for in 1 1 Kings 3, 9. Solomon says this. He says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? 
Out of everything in the world, Solomon says, help me to have wisdom. Let me know the difference between good and bad because I realize that my heart is wicked and I realize that my mind can play tricks on me and I can realize that I am naturally prone to selfishness. So the things that I think are right sometimes are wrong and the things that I think are wrong sometimes are right. So God, I need your help to know the difference. Help me to know the difference between good and bad. I don't want to do bad things. And I also don't want to stand in the way and miss out on good things. Sometimes following God's will for your life will cause tension between you and your family. People that aren't going in the same direction. It might not be easy. And sometimes following God's will for your life will cause people to think that you're wrong. And maybe even evil. If you follow God's word, to, uh, God's word today, you're going to be countercultural. You're not going to be able to fit in. That doesn't mean you get to be hateful and fight everyone. It means that you says, "Hey, hey, look, this is what the Bible says, and I believe the Bible." It's hard to follow Christ, and it takes sacrifice if you're doing it right. It will challenge and it maybe even threaten the people around you. People don't want to change. People don't want to, uh, to move. They don't want you to make waves and make them uncomfortable. But Christ is not unfamiliar with your pain. He knows it. He understands it. He loves you. So press on. Don't get distracted. There's that old song, uh, though none go with me, still I will follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Fast forward years in the future. Jesus died and rose again. The church is born. And we know that Mary, even if she was unsure of all of Jesus' methods and probably worried about him, she was there every step of the way. She was at the cross. She was at uh, the, where uh, she saw Jesus as a, a risen Christ. She was there after the resurrection. She witnessed Jesus ascending to heaven. So even if she had doubted his methods along the way, she understood in the end that he was doing what was right. Now, as far as Jesus' brothers, we know pretty confidently that James, the brother of Jesus, believes on him after the resurrection and became a leader in the church of Jerusalem, wrote a book of the Bible with his name on it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 mentions the rest of Jesus' brothers, along with other apostles. So they were spreading the gospel as missionaries. So it's, it appears that all those brothers that thought that maybe he had lost his mind come around after the resurrection as well. Because, you know, someone says, I'm going to die, and then they do it, and then they're dead for three days, and they come back. That kind of convinces you a lot uh, about what they said previously. We don't have much information on Jesus' sisters, but we see here that family dynamics can change. Jesus' family thought he was out of his mind at one point, uh, but we're sure that many of them later joined in on his message and carried the gospel to the world. So even if your family dynamics are tense because you're trying to follow Christ, don't lose hope. Don't let them pull you away because it might just be that they're trying to see if it's real. They're trying to see if you've really changed. They're trying to see if you really have something in your relationships with Jesus Christ. Hey, even if people think you're evil because you believe the Bible and want to follow God, they might come around too. But until then, surround yourself and connect with people that are trying to follow God's will. The bonds of the church family are strong. And necessary. But it doesn't happen on accident. You have to reach out. You have to cultivate those relationships. You have to build them. If you're hurting, reach out. If you want help, uh, reach out. If you want to help someone, reach out. And God, help us to never stand in the way of what you are doing. Help us to never call good things evil. 
God, please help us to have wisdom, to avoid sin and join in to where you are working. So church, love God and love people and love your neighbor and love your enemy and follow Jesus no matter what and leave the rest up to him. With every head's bowed and eyes closed, so worship band comes. There were times as a youth pastor where we'd go to church camp and one of the students would give their life to Christ or maybe even surrender to, you know, be a missionary or full-time service or something. And it always broke my heart when we'd get back home and their parents would talk them out of everything. You didn't really mean that. There was one time in particular where a girl that was struggling called her parents on the ride home. She wept in the back as they tried to tell her that she wasn't serious. It's hard to follow Christ. And if no one told you that before, they did you a disservice. It's not easy if you're going to give up everything that everyone else cares about to follow Christ. Your priorities might not match up with everybody else's. Maybe that's you today. You need to rededicate the fact that you're a follower of Jesus. I'm not talking about getting saved again or, or, you know, anything like that. I'm talking about surrendering your life again because somewhere along the way, you allowed someone to talk you out of it. You used to be excited. You used to be all in. Someone looked at you like they looked at Jesus and they say, he's lost his mind. Why isn't he going there? Why isn't he doing this? It's so obvious that they should do this. Maybe that's you today. You need to surrender because you allowed someone to talk you out of it. Or maybe you're more like the scribes and the Pharisees. And you're the person that if you're not in on something and it's not your idea that sometimes we are tempted to call it wrong. Or maybe you've been influenced by the culture and some of the things you know the Bible says are wrong, you started to call those evil things good. And maybe what you need to pray for today is wisdom. Just like Solomon. God, help me to know the difference between good and evil. Because it's not easy. That's a hard thing to do, to know the difference between good and bad. Let's take a minute as they play. Maybe you fall into one of those two categories where you need to re-surrender your life. Say, God, I've got so distracted. I've allowed the things of this world to pull me away from you. Maybe you're the one you might even just now figured out that you've been standing in the way of some good things. And if you're honest, maybe Maybe the main reason that you're standing in the way is because it wasn't your idea. Or maybe you've been that one that's tempted to call evil things good because it's easier in this culture. I don't want to create waves. I don't want to stand against things. Maybe you're here today, and really, you're just struggling. Depression, anxiety, financial issues. 
And really what we talked about in the beginning with our offering is the thing that you need to to tell Christ today is that, God, I'm going to seek you first, your kingdom, and I'm going to trust that everything else is going to get taken care of because you take care of the birds, you take care of the plants, you created me, you breathed life into me, and that's on you. So I'm just going to trust you. you're here and you aren't sure that you are a follower of Jesus. You don't know for sure that if you died today that heaven would be your home. You can settle that today once and for all. The greatest decision that you have ever made. It's simple, but it's not easy. So you have to admit that you're a sinner. Nobody likes to do that. We like to think that we're pretty good and we're not that bad. See, what the Bible tells us is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person that has ever lived has participated in sin. And sin is simply anything we say, anything that we do that breaks God's law. We've all lied and cheated and stolen and said wicked things and thought wicked things. And that creates a separation between us and God. The Bible goes as far to say that the wages, what we earn for our sin, is death. And that's more than a physical death. That's a separation from God forever in a place called hell. But Romans 5.8 says that God commended his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That God wasn't okay with us being lost to sin. And he himself got off the throne of heaven. And Jesus was born as a virgin, or uh, of a virgin. And he lived a perfect and a holy life. And he laid down his life on a cross in your place. He took the punishment that you deserve for your sin. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You could call on him once and for all right now. Put your faith in him. Realize you're a sinner. And repent and turn from your ways. Words aren't important. Not a magic prayer. But as we sing, why don't you call out to God? We continue in this attitude of prayer. And if you make that choice today, I'd love to know about it. Say, hey, Pastor Phil, I accepted Christ today. I chose Jesus. Write that on your connection card. You continue to pray and and let God deal with your heart as we sing. In your name we pray.
so thankful that our God does not give up on us. Amen? Praise the Lord. And we're so thankful also to be with you today uh, at Clarksburg Baptist Church. Hey, if you're here for the first time and you filled out your connection card, if you want to take your card down to the cafe, which is right down these stairs, uh, we've got coffee there, but we've also got a gift for you. Uh, this, not this one, but a mug. Someone, Does someone have a... a connection card they already filled out, I'll just throw it right to you, right? No, I'm just kidding. I won't do that. But hey, check, uh, go check out our cafe. We'd love to just hang out with you for a little while and get this gift. Hey, Clarksburg Baptist Church, we love you so very much. Those of you online, thank you so much for joining us as well. And we will see you next Sunday. You are sent out into the world as a missionary. Go, go get them. <laughs>